Hey, it's Melissa Max, and I am live at Disney's California Adventure. I'm here with Stacia, and you are Disney's artist slash historian. Mm -hmm, which are two jobs that you wouldn't think would go together. Right? You and think to polar opposites. Exactly. I just, you know, type my magazine articles in my books with one hand, and I'm holding the hairdryer on the painting with the other one. So <laughs> I just do both. But See, men could not do this. Men can't multitask. I guess like not. Oh, no, well. I have a question about yes. you. You are, like, probably the expert on Disneyland. And last night, my friend and I were discussing Walt Disney and this crazy idea that he had mm -hmm. to start Disneyland. Uh... I mean, it's crazy. It and was. It, and it was so crazy that it worked. But can you give us a little uh, perspective and a little uh, history on that? Sure. How did people react to that? Well, people thought he was out of his mind, first of all. But this was kind of a phrase he had heard before. Back in the 1920s, Walt was just making inroads and becoming a successful film producer and animator with Mickey Mouse and Steamboat Willie and all this. Then, But he said, you know... It's, it's just not enough. I need more. So he decided to basically sell his car and pay for a recording session to put this newfangled sound on cartoon film. And he did. And of course, the world beat a path to his door and Mickey Mouse became a megastar. People thought he was nuts to do that at first. He also uh, was thought crazier than a loon to want to take cartoons, which were like little seven minute things that you saw before your main feature and make a feature film out of them. Who would pay attention to a cartoon for more than 10 minutes? Well, he said, watch me, and made Snow White and the Seven Dwarves and made History, the world's first animated feature-length film. So people were always telling him he was crazy to do what he was doing, and he was always kind of sighing patiently and going ahead, and... Um, look what happened. So Disneyland was called Disney's Folly and people thought well he, that's it. He's just not going to make it happen. It's, it's going to be the end of the studio. It's going to be all of his resources tied up. That's it. But Walt had a absolutely unwavering belief in his own good judgment and in the skills and abilities of the marvelous team of artists and designers that he'd assembled to make these things happen. And he very cannily used the resources at hand. He got into television for the sole purpose, really, of paying for Disneyland. And, oh, coincidentally, now that I have a weekly television show, I can show people what's going on at the park in the show as well, so it will only help the cause. So all these things were kind of all one big part of a master plan of making what he felt would be the best thing to do and the most fun thing to do. That was his big watchword. Will it be fun? Will I enjoy it? And then will other people enjoy it as well? Making all of those things happen. And let me ask you a question about you. Mm -hmm. Obviously, you're a little obsessed in a very good way with the whole Disney empire. At what age did you first start thinking about Disney and learning about Disney and absorbing everything. Well, like any little kid, you know, I grabbed a crayon at about age two, and uh, I found that I really loved it. I mean, it was my favorite playtime activity. I had to be chased outside to get some sunshine. <laughs> and about the age of five, it started looking like something. And by the age of seven, seriously, in third grade, when we had career day, which I felt was when you chose, I thought I was very grown up in third grade, <laughs> I announced that I was going to be a Disney artist because I love drawing, I love Disney, wow. I've never lived out of earshot of the Disneyland fireworks here in Orange County, and I said, well, this is certainly the world I want to be part of, so I was able to persevere and make my crazy dream come true, I was able to start with Disneyland here, a week and a day out of high school, and then go wow. to college while working, and I'm now looking at, and yes, get your calculators out, you can tell how old I am. I'm now looking at uh, having my 37th anniversary here at Disneyland coming up in June. That is unbelievable. What was your first Disney job? My first role here in Disneyland was on Main Street USA in a store that was at that time called the Disneyana Shop. And we didn't have a new collectibles industry or market then. This was 1978. People didn't really collect like they do nowadays. So at that time, what we did was a novel thing. We actually had buyers going to swap meets and flea markets, and occasionally we'd even clean out closets at the studio and uh, sell old, cool Disney things. And that was my hobby. And as an artist, I was paying great deals of attention to the art. But also as a collector, I loved this stuff. And the best way of knowing where good art reference is and the best way of collecting things you love is to learn about it. So I told them, hey, wouldn't it be good to have me in this store where people who love what I love are going to be asking questions that I can actually answer? And they said, why, yes. And so <laughs> there I was, and I began um, college then that September, and then that October I did my very first freelance art project for the company, and off I went. Wow, you are 
besides the fact that you know so much, you're actually really, really inspirational too. There's a there's a great message there for people to find your passion and follow it. Follow and the it dream into a, into a, a career and, and exactly. It's a job, it's a passion. And I'll you. tell you, there is no greater satisfaction than having something that you love and then being able to be a part of making sure that it remains intact mm -hmm. and gets passed on to subsequent generations. And that they is love a great it as privilege. much as you do. So exactly. it's got to be really, really satisfying. Mm -hmm. And two, for Walt Disney, someone who orchestrated and gave us so much, who flaunted the odds and just persevered on to be able to keep his impossible dream absolutely 100% accessible to everybody is the greatest privilege of all. Because think of what he's given to me. Yeah. Thank you so much. My pleasure.